Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Sammy Birch. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Mission. Um, today we're talking about raw materials and robotics, resilient automation in the construction manufacturing supply chain. Uh, we've got a great topic today, a great discussion for you. Um, and I'll go ahead and get us started introducing our panelists. Today we've got Mike Chico, the President and CEO of Fanuc America Corporation. Scott Lindemann, the CEO of Mission Design and Automation, and Ryan Lillibridge, the Director of Business Development here at Mission Design and Automation. Um, Mike, thanks for being here. We're really excited about this discussion today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path? Um, go ahead. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so first of all, thanks, Sammy and the Mission team. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this. It's a great topic. Um, uh, I, as you see on the screen there, I've been at FANUC for over 20 years, 22 years to be exact. Um, and I started really as, a, as an engineer, so I came up uh, programming robots. It was always my first passion uh, ever since college, uh, getting into software and doing programming, and came up through that. I, I actually did systems for a long time, just like a systems integrator does today um, in a variety of different fields, and so we, having that as background, uh, I really started to work with system integrators exclusively Kind of in the middle of my career and and helped and worked uh, build and find new integrators um uh, i've been ceo now for the last five years and it's certainly been a roller coaster jumping into this and then having uh having covid first and now supply chain uh struggles and things but uh you know this the topic that we're going to talk about today and and the associated topics around automation and supply chain uh, in the day, in the in the world that we live in today, it's just been so exciting to see how uh, the supply chain and how the automation world has changed with uh, the way the world works today. So I'm excited to get a part of it. And uh, Scott Ryan, I'm happy to be a part of this with you. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Scott Lindemann here. Uh, I see by the notes here, I'm actually the old guy, so I get 30, but actually I would say 32 also. So, and uh, similar to Mike's story, I'm an engineer by trade. Uh, grew up. Uh, just a technical geeky kid and went to college and and uh, really got hooked on the application of technology to real world and then you get into automation world and you look at people's real problems in manufacturing it has kept my attention and my passion for the last 30 years and it's been a nice career for me the, to take care of the technology and bring it to different industries is kind of the the root of what the passion is and that when you're a systems integrator, you're on the forefront of that in the manufacturing world, and it uh, has kept my interest for sure. And then you go to the, another place where we're headed today, and some of the new markets and some of the new emerging places where automation and robotics is uh, becoming more applicable and more accepted. And I think that's where you really see the changes come, and uh, we're excited to talk about that today. And then the last thing is, you know, it, as a just a feel good motivator is that society is looking to how to create better jobs and that, as mike mentioned the pandemic has us all thinking about what is a good job what's an essential job and what those jobs should be and uh, i think looking at new markets and where automation can help make better jobs for people and and more jobs for up training and upskilling your people to the new technology is a uh, very important and very passionate part of this conversation today so i look forward to talking more I'm uh, Ryan Lillibridge, uh, Director of Business Development here at Mission Design and Automation. Um, looks like I'm the young guy of the group here, 16 years in. Um, very similar story though, uh, started in college for engineering. Um, prior to that, uh, played with Legos, broke my mom's watches, broke stuff around the house to see how it worked, tried to put it back together. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, but that's kind of how I found my way into the mechanical engineering degree and a product design and manufacturing degree. Uh, and I started in automation uh, through a co-op program uh, in college. And that piqued my interest. First, I didn't know what it was, but piqued my interest when you start seeing robots move around and the different industries and processes that uh, you get to be involved with. Um, I couldn't see myself doing something else. So uh, that's where I've been. It, the exposure to multiple different market segments and industries over the years has been a blessing. Um, each market segment has something to teach and something to learn uh, through the process. And uh, just excited to talk about 
you know, supply chain and construction and what that looks like. It's a new industry and a little bit new market for automation. Uh, with any new automation in an industry like this, it's it's always interesting to hear the, the challenges that are there, um, what the people's pain points are, what they're struggling with, and then also just excited to share that journey with other people along the way um, as we grow as a company and hire additional people in their co-op phases and they can learn automation as well. Uh, excited to be able to do that here and, and share those the excitement of automation with uh, up and coming students. So, Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so like, like they said, today we'll be talking a little bit more uh, about supply chain challenges, automation um, in construction, and construction supply chain um, is a matter of when, not if. Um, so uh, we've had, uh, this is the second webinar in our series. We've had um, one that we talked about automation in the construction home building space. Uh, this one we're going to talk a little bit further up the supply chain from that in the raw materials space. So not only is there a great opportunity to automate construction and home building processes themselves, but to automate processes earlier in the supply chain uh, within those facilities that prep the raw materials. Um, and then, of course, as everyone has mentioned, uh, navigating today's supply chain challenges. Um, throughout this webinar, please feel free to ask questions. We'll have some time at the end to ask uh, questions, but if you have one that comes up right as we're going through the slides, please uh, just use the questions function um, on the webinar control panel um, and type it in there and we'll answer it as they come. Um, all right, let's get started. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Sammy, appreciate that. Um, state of automation for the construction sector. Um, something that we're looking at, we talked about it a little bit last time, I want to talk about a little bit more this time as far as what that looks like. Uh, we're seeing the uh, automation in other areas. So if you look at automation in the U.S. construction sector, there's room for growth in comparison to uh, some European and Asian countries. So there's a number of drivers that play into that. Uh, that include demand for prefabricated timber elements and other prefabricated components. Uh, just for comparison purposes, uh, in Sweden, about 84% of detached houses use some type of prefabricated uh, timber element in comparison to the US is at 5%. So it kind of gives you a scale of, of what it could be. Uh, a couple other European countries are picking up on that with Germany at 9%, Netherlands at 20%. But also in Asia, you see that as well. Um, about 15% of homes in Japan are using prefabricated components. So just kind of, Talking about that scale and what that looks like shows you that there's opportunity and there's countries that could be used as examples to learn from uh, for the US. Um, but they also had drivers and indicators that pushed them into that automation maybe sooner than we needed to be. So I think we're moving into that. <clears throat> Some of those uh, drivers were um, higher demand uh, in their areas. Uh, additional drivers were population density, uh, perception of prefabrication, lumber quality, uh, home sizes. I'll jump into that a little bit here. But uh, population density uh, has an impact on the U.S. due to some of the shipping constraints around modular homes. Uh, often you want to be within a 500-mile shipping radius. In Europe, for example, that's from Paris to Berlin. Uh, it covers a pretty broad span. So that incorporates a large population in that span. However, in comparison to the U.S., you could be in a 500-mile shipping radius and, and not hit near that population, depending where your where your center of your factory is, right? So that plays into part of that consideration for automation. Um, another thing is the home sizes, as I mentioned. The home sizes in Europe are typically 36 feet long for a modular home, and the U.S., you're going to see them up to 76 feet or even longer. Uh, that has some constraints on the automation being used in Europe versus what we'd see in the US. So that's some room for growth there. But it's just a little bit different system being used there versus here, lumber quality as well. Uh, different types of uh, lumber being used. Um, there's also a perception in the US of prefabricated being low, cal low quality in the past. I think that perception's changed. There's a lot of people that are, um, pushing and, and 
giving better information about what prefabricated means, what modular means, what that looks like. And often, if not always, the quality of what you can get from those is going to be higher than what you're going to get on a site built or stick built type home. So, but there's still a stigma that tracks with that sometimes that have kind of put that in a lag demand. Um, but the U.S. has been evolving, uh, shift around the traditional home build process. So the perception of prefab has improved. People are working on that. So that's driven more demand up. Um, there's a number of other drivers in the U.S. that I think poise it for automation. Uh, for example, there's a shortage of 5 million homes in the U.S. So if the current construction manufacturing group were to double its output, it'd likely still take five to six years to fulfill that need. So there's a lot of need there. Uh, the demand in housing has gone up. Um, with that, you've also seen the labor pool availability change in the U.S. It was a shortage prior to the pandemic. Uh, some of that was availability for that type of work. The other was a uh, skilled trades gap that we see in more than just um, construction homes. So that gap along with the demand uh, and being exasperated by the pandemic and then also supply chain shortages, I think have really um, opened it up to conversations around different building materials and different components as well as our process. We have to decide if we have enough people in today to tackle those items. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of what we're seeing um, in this market segment. I don't know if uh, Mike or Scott, if you have anything to add to that. But. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and talk about some of the takeaways from what uh, I was just listening to you talk about, Ryan, is that the technology itself of being able to automate and, and use robotics and new technology in the home construction business is not new. It's being done in other places and we're a little bit maybe behind the times in that there we're actually more similar than we are dissimilar from other markets. So I think the North American market needs to do a couple of things. You need to go and look around and see what's out there and then, then ask for it to be adapted to your needs as an as a US or a North American company instead of just, well, I don't have they don't have what I need, so I won't do anything. This is a, an important takeaway is that the technology needs to be driven by the users here, where I think the users in other markets have seen the need, they've driven the uh, driven the supply and it's and it's really paid off for them. We can see that. So I like to say, go look and see, see what's out there and look around and then bring that technology that applies to you back and apply it as needed. And, and it's an important uh, takeaway that I that I gathered from that. I don't know, Mike, you have other feedback on what's happening around the world? Yeah, Scott and, and Ryan, it's it's a great introduction. And as I was listening to Ryan go through your comments, um, I started thinking that uh, even though we're here and I think a lot of the folks online are, are within this the, the home building and construction and raw material business, what I kept thinking about is, is this has happened in so many other different industries as well, where automation starts to evolve in one country or another before it really starts to propagate through the rest of the world. Uh, for example, in the automotive industry, the European car builders got into laser welding a lot faster than the North American car builders did. And um, in, in the Asian countries, uh, using robots and automation in prepackaged foods um, happened a lot sooner in Asia and, and it's like a lot of the different reasons, even though it's a totally different industry, a lot of the same things that Ryan mentioned of there's a lot of factors why a certain country or region might adopt automation sooner or later than than the others. But uh, and then Ryan or, or Scott, to your point, it, it really does. It, it's it's out there. It's happening. It's it's already been implemented in ways. So the folks here in, in this market need to really look in, and see what's out there. And that's the great thing about using a, a system integrator like Mission is you guys see that. You you know about all those things and you know how you can adapt what's already been developed and, and do it for this market. And so um, maybe it's a way to give people a peace of mind that we're not talking about something unique. We're talking about things that happen all the time in the marketplace of um, automation that sprouts up in one region and then starts to propagate to other regions. And I have one other one other color to add is that this labor shortage 
Um, it's affecting everyone right now, and it's maybe it's because of a pandemic, maybe it's because of uh, increased demand, as Ryan alluded to, the demand's going up. And then the third leg of the, the problem is that uh, we're not training enough skilled tradespeople, et cetera. So all of that comes into play. And then when we, we talk about automation coming in, generally we hear from end users going, yeah, I can't get my people to work. I can't get my skilled labor. And now you want to put automation and I'm going to have to go find one of those automation technical guys that are hard to find and they're expensive also. So how do you go about addressing that, Ryan? Or where do you see finding people and what what's required to support automation and robotics in a new product? Yeah, I think uh, given a new product, um, Sometimes if we're early into the new product, there's design changes or manufacturing changes or things that can take place in the product design phase to um, design for manufacturability. So in the construction segment, a lot of things are already established. So for someone leading into that and get into um, with the system integrator, I would, I would say, come talk to us. Uh, some of the systems are there's, there's ways that you can be very expensive to do automation and very big, and there's ways that you can step into it uh, strategically, uh, picking the right size systems, um, pointing in the right area for ROI or pointing in the right area for your future vision of your company that captures uh, the upskilling of your workforce, allows you to build confidence in automation. That really depends on where you start in the process. Um, and the system integrators are your partners that are going to come alongside you and help you have those conversations. And if there's not a right automation solution, they're going to guide you to something that is helpful regardless. Our, our goal is to help you uh, leave you better than when we came. Um, ideally, that's with automation, but uh, the goal is just to help out. I can you speak a little bit to the training and how the investment in training uh, people coming up is going? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've got, uh, well, I'll add some more clarity as, as we get to some of the future slides, but this is something that from an automation community, we've seen the need to uh, educate young people that are coming into the industry as well as the existing workforce on uh, the benefits and the and the training around automation. Um, and so it's it's definitely not something that's new. It's something that we've been working on for a long time. Um, we have robots right now in over 1,400 different educational institutions uh, across just North America, where um, whether it's a community college, a high school, or, or even up into a university, where we have real robots training uh, students on how to do that. And then, all, and then in addition, working with the end customers to find pathways for the existing employees to start to understand how automation works. Um, it's really not as scary as it as it sounds. It, you can think of automation as just another piece of equipment where in your facilities, uh, especially in this business, you have you have m many, many pieces of equipment in your facilities and your, your people are already trained on how to do certain things around the equipment that you have. And teaching someone how to use a new piece of equipment, um, even if it has a robot embedded into it someplace or some level of automation around it, um, it really isn't that scary and there's a lot of pathways to either get new people um, or train your existing people. So uh, it, it, uh, it's not that scary and it's easy to do. So, and, and uh, using a system integrator as well, um, you know, it, it kind of comes pre-configured anyway. So you're really just trying to operate it and maintain it as opposed to developing something brand new. Yeah, thanks Mike. Yeah, and I'll just share one more thing about that is, you know, we. You heard all three of us talk about how we were technical guys and engineers and we figured it out when we were young. And I think there's that same pent up demand amongst all employees now is to always learn new skills and to upskill and learn the new technology. So there is a desire there and it's becoming easier and easier. So if we segue into our next little bit of a topic here is to talk about that there's more than just the construction of the actual house. We go upstream a little bit and we talk about some of the other supply chain things, right? And how automation's being used to make faucets or light bulbs and, and doorknobs and all of those things already. And it's not so new as we think, right? So what we look at is how the end assembly can come together and those are big tasks, but it's not the only place that we can improve the supply chain in, in the construction business, right? It's all those uh, final assembly of the home 
Okay, but what about upstream, right? So there's a lot of opportunities and some of those are big companies and some are small companies. And I think it's important to realize you don't have to be a great big company to be able to say that automation is good for you. Ryan alluded to that it can be very simple and it doesn't have to be expensive and it can be the most productive thing you can do. So how you get started on that is important to think about is uh, there's not really the barrier anymore of I have to be a huge company with a great big capital budget. You just need to get started. And that's my main kick throughout most of these webinars for the last year or two has been just get started down to your automation journey. And it, it is a journey and then you tend to grow with it and you wanna have successes. So whatever you're manufacturing, you wanna get started. You wanna look around. If you're a small company, look at what other people are doing. Ask some integrators, call your local robot guy, call your local PLC or HMI guys. Ask people, get involved with your tech schools, as we alluded to. They're a great hotbed of information. Get involved with your high school first robotics programs. Just get started out there in that robotics world and automation technology stuff. And what you'll find is you'll get connected to a lot of people. Hopefully, there's the majority of them are good stories about how automations went in the past, but you'll hear what not to do as well. And there's plenty of lessons to be learned from people. So. Don't think you're alone in this. There's a lot of people on this journey at different phases in the journey, and I think it's important. So the, the other thing we, we talk about on this slide is just where else the automation can apply. And as I mentioned, it's already available in a lot of different industries. The wood industry is one of the, the lagger because it's, it's hard, it's a natural product. It's like in automotive, as Mike alluded to, you put car frames together for a long time, but you're, not stretching leather over car seats automatically. It's a different kind of a product. So wood lends itself to be a little harder, but so leading the way has been the steel part of construction. It's been the subcomponent part of it. It's in the uh, stone industry is another one that's a big industry because it's big and heavy and dirty, right? So you look at where is the, where in your business, is there a tough job to do? something that a person is not very good at actually and can be automated because quite often the last thing you do is you'll say oh boy this job i have a lot of people doing it so i want to replace all these people but in reality it may be a task that people are really good at and we just want to keep it there so then what we'll do as an automation integrator we'll come in and we'll evaluate your entire process and we'll look at upstream and downstream where the most value add and maybe even the lowest risk for the least amount of capital to get started or if you're ready to go on a big project we can take on more than that and that's where you want to get a local integrator and an expert like mission to come in and do an evaluation so how do, they, how do you get started ryan what's the first steps in that yeah sure i, I think uh, you hit a couple points in there too scott um one of the things with automation is it has that perception of replacing people but with labor shortages uh, it's not really the goal. Uh, the goal is really to amplify your workforce and get more done uh, with automation. So where to look, how to start. Um, some of the things you want to just walk around your floor and look for are um, dull, dirty, dangerous, degrading, and then um, repetitive task. Uh, do you, are you having employee attrition rates on a certain task? Uh, you just can't keep someone in that position or they want to switch jobs or uh, there's fallout there. That's that's a good indicator that maybe that work could be automated and that person could be going somewhere else or it's it's not engaging to them. Uh, one of the things we're seeing is uh, the workforce right now is uh, not looking to get into manufacturing or a, a factory job per se. But if you're able to put automation in place, it's, it's now um, I can go home and tell my parents I have a robotics job and I'm working with automation. Uh, changes that dynamic. So it also can change your hiring um, capabilities for that labor pool shortage. So that's another thing to perhaps consider is uh, how am I hiring people and what message am I sending when they walk out on my floor? What do they see? Do they feel like they've walked back in time uh, or do they feel like they're walking into the future? Uh, and that's That can make a big difference on who's available. So I think those are some areas that you can look for. And then uh, there's always the mention of ROI um, and different ways to calculate that, that a lot of system integrators can help out with. And then uh, looking at your work environments for your employees or any uh, of your safety recordables, where's that stuff happening? How can I keep my workforce safer? Um, 
Mike, you probably see this a lot of different places and with a lot of different customers. What are some ways that uh, Fanuc can get started? Yeah, I think that it's such a great question of, of how to get started. And as Scott mentioned, you just need to get started. That's the biggest thing is to get started. And um, one, of the, one of the things I'm always amazed about in this industry is how willing um, other companies are to share their successes with others, even within the same industry. And it's a really good move to, uh, you know, say, so say whoever people on the line right now listening may be thinking, all right, I, I, all right, I hear that I should get started. How do I get started? You talk to talk to Mission, talk to us, and we might be able to take you to places that um, do very similar things, even maybe within even in the same industry where you can see firsthand how others are doing things. Um, and it may not be completely the same, but it'll give you a sense of oh, I can see how this product gets handled or I can see how this thing gets finished um, or marked or something like that or stacked. Um, and so going out to see other installations to see what success looks like, uh, because one of the other areas, Ryan, you mentioned, on, you mentioned ROI. A lot of times people line up ROI and they'll look at it maybe even just strictly from a labor perspective. I do it with this much labor now. The, the task in the future has a, a Y amount of labor. And so that's my payback. But there are so many more places within ROI um, that are kind of hidden that you wouldn't necessarily see. And that's where going to look at other installations and talking to other people or, or talking to us or a system integrator really, really helps because you may not think that, you know, you have breaks, uh, people that do things manually, there's breaks throughout the day. And those little five to 10 minute breaks um, or, or times of, of, uh, not being productive really add up over time, and you, I've seen it a lot over the years of people coming in and thinking, I expected to get X number of parts out of my system because that's what I got when I did it manually, and when I started to do it automatic because it worked through lunch, it worked through breaks, uh, my my efficiency went up so much or my quality went up so much, and you need to start putting dollars to those types of things in terms of scrap rate. Um, and, and what quality means, what workers' compensation claims you might have uh, in terms of things that are, that are harmful to people uh, that you do today that you might want to automate. So there's a lot of different areas where, where Mission and, and us, we can help identify some of those ways to just get started. And uh, don't be afraid to uh, go out and see some other types of installations. And then conversely, if you start to automate, don't be afraid to open up your doors to others as well. Uh, to show people what it is, because the whole industry is something that needs help. So uh, really, really good points to get started. Yeah, we've got a question um, as you were talking about the, you know, mitigating the labor shortage. What other industries have you seen address labor shortages with robotics? Um, Toby's asking that. So um, I guess, Mike, if you want to lead that off, um, maybe. Yeah, totally. yeah it's, I, I almost can't. I, I couldn't, we'd be here for the rest of the hour talking about how many industries are out trying to mitigate the labor shortage with people. Um, one of the biggest, newest ones today is, is in the e-commerce area um, in the warehousing space because it requires so many people. Um, and it's one we're only just starting to scratch the surface of uh, because as, as Scott mentioned, dealing with wood is a hard thing, uh, but also then dealing conversely, like in the e-commerce area, dealing with uh, an unlimited number of SKUs of the different products that you might need to handle in a, in a distribution center is a pretty big challenge as well. But we're in there and we're doing a lot of things to try to overcome that. Um, another big area, you, a lot of people think that the automotive industry is the most automated in the world. And, it, and in a lot of ways it is in terms of the density to robots uh, compared to people. But there are areas of the final assembly part of the car where Scott mentioned stretching the leather over a seat or putting the uh, IP panel into the car or putting the wheels onto the car are all things that uh, still require a lot of people. Um, and they're all jobs that uh, are, are pretty stressful on people's joints and, and dangerous because things are heavy. So that's another big area. Um, but it's across the board. It's almost every manufacturing industry is having a hard time with labor right now. Um, and, and if you looked at any of the statistics that come out for robots and automation, you'll see that we're, we're seeing unprecedented growth in the use of robotics across our country as, and around the world uh, because so many people are looking to automation to try to mitigate 
some of the labor shortages. But that's just yeah, a couple. And I'll just I'll just jump in. In the in the construction business, the there's a lot of automation over the years historically for cabinet manufacturing, and windows and doors have been highly automated. So inside that industry alone, there's a lot. And then there's some other processes like polishing and making fittings and, and uh, interior components of the home. And then if you think even as far as uh, just using a robot to palletize shingles coming off the line in their flats and how much, that's a tough job to do all day. And there's uh, a lot of opportunities where you can see robots palletizing the raw materials coming off five gallon jugs of paint and all kinds of things that are being handled by robotics at the processing of those products where they're coming off of the main assembly lines in the construction industry. Brick and block is shown here. That's another one that's been highly automated over the years and is moving into robotics for flexibility. So it's, it's maybe not labor savings, but the flexibility now because everybody wants what they want when they want and it's driven by the e-commerce and the attitude of people that don't want to wait they want what they want when they want it so they need highly flexible automation which is another thing that's driving to go to robotics over hard automation historically those industries have been automated with blocks and the cabinetry and stuff but more recently they go to a lot more robotics because of the flexibility that that tool brings to them in their industry which allows them to deliver more what you want when you want it at the right time and and still have all the benefits of automation so great question it it's uh, hard to give uh, I, hopefully we gave you a couple examples there it makes some sense to you toby but uh we definitely can talk more about your exact application anytime so yeah i think What's we can uh, we we tackled kind of this slide so let's jump into the next one i think yeah, this is one. Um, maybe I can add some. Uh, I can add some color right off the bat on this one because this supply chain issue. Um, I know that everyone online is facing it because it's such a it's such a big problem uh, in the in the world today. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem to be getting a whole lot better right now. But uh, one of the things that this is driven. So in terms of overall supply chain. Um, it's it's been a big challenge for the overall industry, but what what we're seeing is is just a just an impact on people trying to localize manufacturing so much more. Um, so that that may not be uh, super relevant to what you guys are doing online because you're already doing a lot of local manufacturing. But we're seeing it throughout the industry that the supply chain issues that that we're facing is really driving a localization of manufacturing. And, and that's been driving a lot of business in each region. So I mentioned that, that the robotics business in America is growing, but it's also growing around the world because there's this localization of manufacturing that's happening everywhere. Um, but we're right in the middle of it right now. Um, FANUC, if you don't know uh, our overall history, uh, our, most of our robots are made in Japan or a Japanese robot company. Uh, although we make a large portion of the robots in America for the painting industry, uh, most of our products do come from Japan. And um, right now on the port of Los Angeles, there's over 100 container ships just sitting um, out uh, in the water waiting to get docked. And it, it, it has led to massive delays and, and big, big, uh, big disruption. You've probably read all the news articles that Christmas is going to get generally affected and the, the, the things that you might want to buy are going to be harder to find. Um, and so uh, that's something that uh, that we're facing right now from FANUC. Uh, we, we, we're dealing with a supply chain challenge, but as a manufacturer for people that are local here in the marketplace, we're seeing a lot of people want to control their own destiny a lot more by trying mm -hmm. to eliminate those supply chain challenges by locally manufacturing things today and finding local sources for things. And um, we're trying to help with that every step of the way. And Scott, I think you guys are probably even seeing it as well for some of the components that you guys supply too. Yeah, for sure. As far as um, supplying equipment, there's um, shortages of all all over the place, and it's making you pay more attention to what you're using. But I want to take this in the direction of uh, how it applies to an to an end user and why, when you automate something, you get more predictable results. Uh, we just had a customer the other day say they can't get saw blades and they can't get sanding pads. Right, very relevant to uh, the construction industry. So. To follow that up, I know if you go to a robotic cutting process or robotic polishing and sanding process, 
quite often you end up using a lot less of those consumables. It's more repeatable of how many you will need and when you'll need them. It's not uh, up to your you, your uh, employee and operator to just load up as many sandy pads as they can. The, the, the process of automating allows you to get way more repeatable and way more understanding of your consumable costs. And it's just as this supply chain puts a pinch on all of these things, it's bringing that way more to the top of everyone's radar when you can't even get it or when the costs have doubled for saw blades and for sanding pads. All of a sudden, I want to look at why am I consuming so many of these parts and how can I get less and get more repeatable use out of these uh, things? And then by automating your processes, you end up getting way more repeatable and quite often less costly consumables. You may have to change your process a little bit, but in the end, you'll have more repeatable and a, and a better uh, use of your consumables. And that's just one of one of exact example how it's affecting a couple customers in a, in the construction industry right now. So, yeah, I think uh, jumping in on that too, Scott. It's um, service life of current equipment, right? I know one concerns moving into automation is kind of the reliability, uh, the lifespan, how long is it going to last? What can I look at? So, some of those things are um, there's a lot of predictive maintenance that can take place through FANUC ZDT um, and other areas where you can see, like you said, Scott, with uh, repeatable processes on your tooling. Uh, if that's uh, automation tooling and that, you start to begin to develop uh, wear characteristics of different tools, cutting bits, saw blades, sanding, um, each one of those things you can start to become uh, predictive on and say, okay, I need to set up this ordering process, which allows you to be more, um, proactive on your supply chain. So as things shift out and they slide out, you know that, hey, based on my current wear, I'm gonna need to order these this many weeks ahead of time to be prepped for this. Um, and a lot of the automation is very serviceable as well. So I think those are some things to consider too as going into this is just kind of the um, flexibility and the serviceability of the equipment. Like maybe you wanna jump in on uh, the reliability of robots. One question I get a lot from customers is it, it, it comes up probably on every robotic system I do with, with a new customer or someone that's just getting into it is what what do I do if the robot goes down? How do I how do I accommodate if the automation quits running? Um, yeah, it's a it's a we we obviously get that uh, get that quite a bit and um, especially as I mentioned having uh, having the robots come from another country. Um, so first and foremost, from a reliability standpoint, um, recognize for those on the line that maybe not be so familiar with robots and automation, um, you can see in the in the picture on the screen now a couple of our robots there in the background. Um, the robots themselves aren't they're not custom made for each application. They're they're standard products that get built on an assembly line, um, uh, much like a lot of the other components that are out in the industry today. And so the level of reliability that comes with uh, an industrial robot is much, much higher than say a piece of custom built automation because um, it's it's built the same way over and over and over again to rigorous specifications. So right off the bat, a lot of people always recognize or, or come back and say to us that um, out of all the pieces of equipment that they have in the factory, that the robot is typically the most reliable piece of equipment that's there because of how it's been designed to be used. Um, but on top of that, because we know that once the robot stops moving, uh, typically the whole line goes down because of how integrated the robot is inside the assembly line. Uh, we mitigate all those risks by, by keeping a, a huge amount of spare parts in inventory. Uh, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in spare parts that we keep locally. Um, we work closely with Mission um, and the integrator base to decide then based off of the end user and what the application is, whether it makes sense to stock parts um, at the facility if, if downtime is super critical. Um, and then from a team, of, uh, a team of installation engineers and service engineers, FANUC has a big group of people that are, are spread out around the country uh, to handle service. Um, we have integrators like Mission that do service themselves. Uh, on the robots that have talented engineers that do that as well. So uh, yeah, they, a lot of times the robot isn't necessarily the thing that breaks down in the first place, but when it does, we've got parts and people 
there to bring it back up and and doing it. But it's a good point to think about though is that the difference between a, a custom made piece of equipment, even if you're just trying to move things say in two or three directions, uh, a two or three axis device and all the custom engineering that might go into develop and designing a device like that, as opposed to a, a robot that may seem complicated because it's like a little arm in there, um, but we're making hundreds of thousands of them and they're all designed in the exact same way. And so there's an inherent level of reliability that comes with that, that is, is a lot of times a much better solution than trying to make a custom piece of uh, equipment or automation to handle a task. Yeah, I'll, I'll just second that. The, the reliability of the equipment and the, and the local support for that process is what really does drive the uptime and the implementation hurdle. No matter what industry you're in and you're trying to automate and you're wondering if it's been done before, we talked early on, look around, see what's been done, take a low risk approach to your entry into automation and then realize that the components you choose, whether it's a robot or a gantry, but you pick the robot for reliability and then what the real downside and the maintenance things are is the process itself. So that's where you want to have some local support and you want to train your people to understand what is the process? What are the things that are going to affect my process overall? And when you start with an integrator, you get involved, you, you point out your upstream and downstream processes, what you're doing. We talk about where to, where to optimize that process so that you can use the people you have in better jobs and you can have a reliable process and then you do predictive and proactive maintenance. And then, uh, of course, for worst case, there's local service. Um, what, whatever the products are, you want to have local service. I know historically automation coming from Europe or coming from overseas, it has a supply chain issue. It has a time change issue. It has a language issue. A lot of support troubles with equipment coming. So the biggest trend I will really push is to, to buy local with integration partners that know you, know you personally, have been in your facilities. And we'll take good care of you and it will drive the success long term of your automation implementation. So let's take the next slide, Sammy, and talk about uh, what's coming up, what the future looks like, and then we'll wrap up with some questions here. So uh, we thought about we, a lot of different ways we can take the future, right? Uh, there's a lot of different things and, and where it's going. Uh, but from an integration perspective and successful in automation, we just said, get started, look for some simple things like maybe it's purely less mistakes, higher quality, better throughput, more repeatable processes, some of those things. You can be an early adopter, so get involved because people are doing it right now. And if you're not started on it, you're getting behind. It's a nice little way of saying it's happening, get started. You can ignore it for at your own peril, those kind of things, but it's happening and you don't have to be that far out on the bleeding edge. You can be in the mainstream use of automation and processes that have been automated for a long time. You don't have to go invent a new wheel every time. I think the last thing on here is, an, is another one is just, just take it one thing at a time and get started. We've talked about, but uh, the pipe dreams that are out there, the printing of 3D houses you see and they, the robots that can walk into your house and grab a sheet of plywood and hang it up. There, there's all kinds of videos on YouTube and Someday that may be real, but uh, right now there's plenty of things that are real and plenty of things to get started on. And it's cool to see all those things, but what we're talking about are things that are available right now that you can do that will get you better throughput, better better use of your labor, and uh, will help make you more successful as a business. That's what we're really looking at right now. And I think it's important. There's plenty of them out there to get started on right now. Yeah, Scott, I think that uh, maybe some of this, and I'll encourage the people listening online to just ask some of the questions um, of what are some of the manufacturing challenges you face today? It, it's, a, it's a good way to get started, but I'm always amazed at how much low-hanging fruit is actually out at some places where people are just waiting to get into the game from an automation standpoint. It's, as simple as just moving a piece of material from one spot to another or flipping a piece of wood over or, or reorienting um, a faucet that, that you have on the assembly line, um, or even just doing some simple inspection where we, you can very simply just have a robot put a camera on the end of it and, and have that robot check a bunch of stuff uh, just to ensure that the quality is done right. So 
uh, it, it, we could be talking about it here in a minute when the questions start coming in, but just to highlight some of the different things that you, you, that you as the customers, as the people on the line face, um, start with the low hanging fruit, start with something that's simple and easy and, and then work your way from there. And, uh, and we can help get your people trained to be able to do that once you get started. Yeah, um, we've got another question right that, that applies to this slide. Um, what is the Canvas application? So we've listed here, we've got drywall, Canvas, 3D printing houses, concrete. Those are some examples. Canvas specifically, could you speak a little bit about that, Scott? Dan asked that question. Canvas is a company that uh, is looking at the drywall and painting application of inside homes or businesses. So it's a pretty cool bit of technology i think it's it's underway i can't speak exactly to their business strategy but the technology again is to, to roll around and sense the walls and sense the seams and, and use what uh, in the technology world is different forms of perception so that i don't have to have a rigid con or uh, exact data i can roll around into a room and i can do the drywall seams and paint any any room that's already done and it's a very nice technology but it's definitely out there on the leading edge right now and how real it is i'll leave it up to the canvas guys you can find online a lot of really cool videos and i think the technology is coming and it just gives you ideas of where things are going so sorry the name is a little bit uh, misleading perhaps but that's what it is it's a nice company i just use that as i things that are out there long term um and they, they will come eventually it's only a matter of when but to get back to our real point there's plenty of stuff that can be applied right now too and i think that's the more beneficial topic of this conversation but you can definitely have hours and hours of fun on youtube looking at uh, cool technology that's out there and someday will come yeah i think it's a good note too there there's a lot of ideas about how to streamline the assembly process with new technologies new materials maybe um the aerospace industry has a lot of similarities that has automation in it for some of the larger components as well. Um, some parlays from that. So there's a lot of money going into investigating new materials, new processes and new pieces and parts. Um, what will set you up to be one of the adopters of that or in a successful position for that would be uh, having that automation and that, that team ready to accept that new technology and familiar with the current technology I think sets you up to better adapt to those products that are maybe more manufacturing friendly in the future. So if you start now with stuff, uh, that allows you to, to have the workforce in place and the familiarity with, with the technology and um, kind of develop your eye for uh, processes that can, can be automated or can be improved. Yeah, I think it will be the topic of a future webinar where we'll talk about what process should be done differently because machines can be really good at things that people cannot be good at. And the home construction business is definitely built around people doing the majority of the processes, right? So drywall is one. You can ask the question, why do we even have seams in drywall? You could ask the question staring at this picture, are we going to come up with an automated robot to put shingles on the roof? Are we going to not put shingles and we're going to do something different? And those are that's definitely questions that it should be on the table when you talk about automation. And uh, I, I'm certain there will be a topic of a future webinar and we'll have a, a lot of detailed discussions about those alternative processes that are available or will be available soon, for sure. Let's jump into the next slide here, Sammy. Um, is, is there more questions on this slide? I don't want to. Uh, there was one we'll we'll come back to it uh let's let's wrap up this slide and then we'll have a few minutes left for the questions that we've got on here okay so how to get so, started right go ahead yep. Scott. no you got it how to get started um you can you can reach out to us connect with mission connect with fanic um i know mike extended the offer too is uh, happy to try and connect you with someone in your industry that's maybe doing something similar already or a parallel industry that has uh, similarities to what you're looking for. Um, that's always beneficial to go out and see and look. So touch base with us. We'll try to connect those dots uh, just through the networks that we have in other markets that have already broached this move into automation. 
Um, many markets have made that journey before, so it's it's always best to start your journey talking to someone that's taken the journey uh, and have a guide there. So I think that would be one way to look at it. Yeah, and then uh, Ryan, we talked about it a little bit uh, on there, but in, just in terms of training, that always does seem to be a barrier. Uh, you know, first is always, well, who else has done this before? And, and this is where you guys can really help bring people around. But from a training aspect, um, this is something I speak to all the time, uh, that um, it's a passion of mine to train young people on how to do this. Like you said, in the very beginning, we all talked about how we like to take things apart, and put them back together. and um, I can only imagine if I had an industrial robot in my, one of my high school classrooms um, uh, where that may where that may have taken me a little bit even sooner in my life than that. And, and it's happening all around now. And we're finding now young people that are recognizing at a very early age that um, getting into advanced manufacturing is a career path that they want to take. And um, they're maybe even coming to that realization right after high school and getting right into the workforce from there um, or uh, finding some passion for manufacturing, starting at that age, and then uh, getting into a technical uh, institution instead of going to a four-year degree program and honing in their skills there. And I'll tell you that uh, that within the two-year um, the two-year technical path, with the programs that are out there, uh, kids finishing that that degree program, that two-year technical degree program, um, have the most complete training that we've even seen in the industry now where there, there's uh, kids at, at a two-year school, you're coming out and you're uh, 19, 20, 21 years old, and you have the most diverse, uh, complete set of skills from an automation standpoint through those programs. And so you're getting really, really qualified people coming out of those those areas. And we can help with that. We I, I mentioned that we have robots into 1,400 different schools around the country. Uh, we can help uh, identify those schools to end customers. Uh, you guys at Mission certainly know that list of schools as well. Um, and pairing up, uh, one of the big um, one of the big buzzwords out in the industry today is is pairing industry and education together. And a lot of big companies are doing it. Uh, certainly in the automotive area and or, and in the e-commerce area and consumer products, they're they're merging between industry and application. But it doesn't have to be a big company. It can be small to medium sized businesses as well, where you find a local community college or you find a local uh, university that, that has some programs for manufacturing and you start to feed a pipeline of people into your organizations. Um, so it's a really good way to get started. I think no matter whether you, you start to head down an automation path or not, um, partnering with a local educational institution to try to drive your labor force is, is a really good idea um, irregardless of, of whether or not you start to automate or not. So uh, just take that for what it's worth that we've seen a lot of positive uh, outcomes when you start, when you when you partner with the local educational institution. So I think it's good no matter what. Yeah, and I think that the training is very important and it's come a long way. And then the, the, the follow-up is the technology has become so much easier to use and to troubleshoot than it has historically. And we could tell a lot of horror stories about somewhere where we got a machine and maybe it came from overseas and there was something wrong with it. And all that came up was a fault number with a red light and something in a foreign language. And the only way you could recover was to go through some kind of roundabout way and wait on the phone for a long time. But the technology nowadays, thanks to people like FANUC and thanks to the, you can hear the buzzwords, the IoT and the cloud-based connected stuff. But what it really boils down to is lowering that barrier to entry to having a successful automation implementation. So now when a fault comes up or the machine stops for some reason, you should fully expect a, a photograph on the, on the display to come up, pointing you to exactly where to go look in English and in the words that your operators use. So we're building machines and the technology allows us to do those kind of troubleshooting things that really keep your operator training requirements down and then as we mentioned there's tons of training out there but the actual need to train is also coming down so that barrier to entry to get started is uh, lower by a lot than what it has been historically i think it's an important expectation that those uh, kind of usability of the automation it is really easy and it's 
very powerful to enable implementation, successful implementation of automation systems. Q&A time, Sammy, you ready? Yes, yep, we've got a, a couple questions. So um, we have a question from Aaron. You have biting off more than you can chew on this slide. That's referring to uh, what the future looks like. Yep. How do you know what is too much and what is enough? Could you speak a little bit more to that? Or give an example? <laughs> a lot of examples of biting off more than you can chew, but at the same time, um, yeah, so justification comes in many ways of how to start or what to automate and why. So you can go through ROIs and you can start with just a little project, but then you say, oh, if I spend $50,000 on this project, or, or I can maybe, what happens is technical people and engineers tend to go, well, we can make a bigger project because it'll be cooler. And all of a sudden, before you know it, it, it grows, right? It snowballs up and it still can have a very good ROI but now it's going to be a six month delivery and it's going to be a million dollars and it and it could be very well paid for itself but in the meantime you could also get started on some of these small ones so the more than you can chew thing is um uh, it's a risk and reward analogy to, to be honest right so it's very individualized there's companies that uh, take multiple millions of dollars of projects as their first project every day and it's successful so it's not about a dollar amount. It's not about a scale. It's more about a comfort and uh, the risk and reward analysis that you should do internally for each project. So I can't really quantify it by dollars or by scale, but I will definitely say measure the risk and reward, what implementation plans you have and who you're using to implement those and then weigh out the risk and reward is would probably be better than the more than you can chew analogy, to be honest. So good question. You have another story, Ryan or Mike? No, you've got it. You've got it covered really well. Like you said, there's no clear answer. We've seen people spend a million dollars on something, um, and it be one of the most basic things where there is very little risk and a very high reward. Um, and then we've seen things as as low as you know, fifteen uh, or, or say fifty, hundred thousand dollar systems that have such a high risk because it could take the whole the whole line down if it wasn't successful. Um, and it's something we would definitely recommend they wait till later to uh, to get a little more experience. So it's it's not about size, it's not about dollars. It's really individualized for each one of what's if it you have to look at it. If it doesn't work, what's the risk to the company? And um, and then that's where an integrator can really help an end user say that in their experience for what you see once you get into the factory that it that this is a pretty low risk or this is a, a higher risk and um, but you have to commit to it for sure. Biting off more than you can chew is one of the things where if you if you decide to move forward on something, but then on the back end, you don't commit to getting proper training or you don't commit to adding a resource that is an expert in that area or, or a maintenance of that area, then you can start to bite off more than you can chew pretty quickly. So uh, it, it, you definitely need to follow through with some of the soft things that come with uh, adding automation in terms of the training and the and the commitment to the resources. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, we're about at the hour, so um, we'll wrap up there. Um, to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in today. We'll be sending out an email with the slide deck. Uh, it'll also be available on our blog um, at missiondesignauto.com uh, in the coming days. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great conversation. You. Thank you all to the rest of our panelists, Ryan, Scott, um, and uh, look look forward to our next webinar coming up in the next month or two here. So. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.